Let's put it this way. There are other species that can recognize things that are alive and are not alive. That doesn't mean that they have like a deep conceptual understanding of life. But, you know, you could argue that we don't really either. You can see different behaviors that animals have in response to living and dead things. You can see that uh, that some animals are, are very good at recognizing biological motion. That is the movement of living things and can distinguish that from the movement of things, you know, like rocks or something that are moving but are not alive. And that's really important for a lot of species. Carl Zimmer, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's an interesting thing talking about life and what it constitutes, right? Because I think a lot of people have heard about discussions to do with euthanasia and assisted suicide. And is this person really alive? What does it mean? Philosophical arguments to do with is somebody in a coma, uh, discussions around abortion, what constitutes life during um, childbirth and, and beforehand. And yet yeah, it's an interesting, an interesting area. It seems like it sort of coalesces a lot of big questions that people have. Uh, it really does. Um, but at the same time, uh, for as important as it is, um, there hasn't been really all that much um, thinking among scientists about you know, life with a big capital L. I mean, when we talk about life, what do we really mean? Um, and so what's really astonishing is that, you know, you can find plenty of definitions of life uh, in the scientific literature, um, but they're different definitions. And I find if I if uh, I start talking about life with a scientist, um, they might very well have a definition and it's different from the one I heard from the last person. Um, so you have a situation which is really strange. I mean, imagine like in chemistry, people didn't agree on what an atom is. I mean, <laughs> that would be kind of problematic. And yet we're in this situation where scientists who study life, life in different forms, they just they really don't agree on what it is they're talking about. Why is it so messy? Um, you know, that's a good question. I think uh, part of the problem is that uh, is is that sometimes we're trying to get at different things when we use the same word. So, you know, um, there are these uh, issues about end of life, you know, so um, is someone who's on a ventilator, are, are they alive? Um, and so we start to talk about... Um, uh, you know, brain death as being sort of the definition of the end of life. Um, but that's really the end of one person's life, um, you know, their state of being alive. Um, whereas other people want to say, okay, um, you know, a snake and a tree and me, we, we all have something in common that's different than a rock. Um, what am I going to call that? And people will say, well, that's life. And so it's a so it can be a way of trying to pull things together into and trying to figure out what they have in common. Um, but, you know, e but the, even then you get yourself into trouble because then, you know, you think you kind of have a nice little category of things that are alive. And then someone comes along with something else like a virus and then everyone starts yelling all over again. Um, so so it's it's. It's a it's marvelously prone to lead to big arguments. Whose job is it to work out what life is? Is it biologists, chemists, philosophers? It's funny. Like, I mean, if you talk to uh, a typical biologist, you know, I, I talk to biologists all the time for my work. And um, if you uh, kind of stop the conversation and you say, oh, by the way, I'm kind of curious, like, um, what's what's your definition of life. I mean, what, what does it mean to be alive? Um, a lot of them actually don't want to really like talk about that at all. Why? Um, well, because, you know, you, you might be a scientist who, let's say you're a, a scientist who uh, studies tigers and you really like tigers um, and you don't know a whole lot about, uh, you know, uh, fungi. They're fine. Um, you know that your tiger and the fungi have some things in common, but like it's not really your job to to get too into that. Like there's enough to do with the tigers. So um, so for a lot of scientists, like life is so big and so complicated and so overwhelming that they really just want to kind of zero in. Um, you know, I mean, somebody, you know, there's some people who just want to study, you know, one protein. Um, uh, so 
that's even smaller, you know, and, and you can get a lot of, you can get a lot out of that as, as a scientist, you can learn a lot, but it is a little awkward when like this, you know, you, as a biologist, you are studying life, right? And yet, um, it, it can be really hard for, to get a straight answer out of scientists about that. But, um, you know, so it's so it so then it, it's fun to find the the people who really are thinking about life, um, and and to get and who are even trying to do research on on you know life itself, and to to figure it, to learn what they're trying to do and how they're grappling with it. But it's uh, definitely a minority. Would you say that humans are the only animals that are aware of life and death? No, actually not. I mean, in uh. uh Let's put it this way. Um, other, there are other species that um, can recognize things that are alive and are not alive. You know, um, that doesn't mean that they have like a deep conceptual understanding of life. But, you know, you could argue that we don't really either. <laughs> um, so, you know, for example, like, I mean, you know, a fish swimming along um, can tell that there's something dead nearby and will avoid it. You know, that, that you can see different behaviors that animals have in response to living and dead things. Uh, you can uh, you can see that uh, that some animals are, are very good at um, sort of recognizing biological motion. That is the movement of living things and can distinguish that from the movement of things, you know, like rocks or something that are moving but are not alive. Um, and that's really important uh, for a lot of species. You know, um, you, you want to, you want to avoid, you know, cadavers that could make you sick. Uh, you want to, um, if, if something's moving, um, it, that could be a predator that's going to kill you, or it could be a rock that's tumbling down and, you know, that could kill you too, but you need to respond in different ways. You know, the rock isn't going to come after you, the predator might. So, um, so there are good evolutionary, uh, benefits to being able to recognize life and death. And we can probably, we, our own sense of life, you know, that we ourselves are alive, um, that probably has these deep evolutionary roots too, um, just sort of monitoring our own bodies and that kind of sense of being alive. It's not like an, a, a rational deduction. You know, we don't say like, ah, from these, these certain things, I deduce that I'm alive. It's just you feel alive. And what's fascinating is that, you know, the flip side is that there is actually a syndrome, a, a psychological syndrome, where people are convinced that they are dead. And they will tell you that they're dead. And they'll explain how they died and how it is that they're still able to talk to you after death. It's called Cotard syndrome, named after a doctor who first recognized it in a patient in the 1800s. So, um, so I actually think that, like, this sort of deep ability to recognize life and death um, actually kind of gets in the way uh, of our trying to understand life scientifically um, it, because we sort of we sort of assume that it's going to be easy you know because it feels easy but it's really if you're trying to understand life uh, as, as scientists it's not easy at all what are some of the stories that the patients that have that Cotard syndrome will tell the doctors um, well, they'll say, well, I, you know, I drowned in a lake last year and I've been a zombie ever since. But they're breathing. Um, they're they, talking. They're telling this to them. I, I, what can I tell you? Like, uh, I, the, the, these are the things that you see in these, in these accounts, you know, and I'm sure, I'm sure that the, the psychiatrists or the doctors were trying to like get that out of them. Like, really? There's like, one lady uh, that was uh, worried about being washed down the drain or something, wasn't there? Yeah, so uh, it, it's pretty common uh, in these reports of Cotard syndrome. It's very rare, but there are enough reports that you can kind of see some patterns. And there is this feeling that people have that they're just a husk. They're sort of empty inside. There's just nothing there. And uh, yeah, and so one woman was saying that that's why she never bathed, because she would just wash away down the drain. Um, and, uh, it's, it's, it's astonishing. Um, and you know what, there, there is just one report that I've seen where there where some scientists tried to actually like, uh, uh, look at the brain of someone with Cotard syndrome. And, um, and what was interesting was that there, there did seem to be some damage to a part of the brain that's involved in monitoring the body, sort of taking in information from different parts of the body and kind of integrating that into a, a feeling um, uh, 
And uh, so if you're not getting those signals, then you just feel, well, hmm, I, there's nothing there. I don't feel alive. Therefore, I must be dead. What are some of the current working definitions of what constitutes life and death? Uh, there are, I mean, there are literally hundreds. Um, but, you know, I think the perhaps the one that you see most often uh, came about um, at a meeting of scientists in the 1990s brought together by NASA. You know, NASA w wanted them to come up with a, uh, a plan for uh, looking for life elsewhere in the universe. And they pretty quickly realized, like, you know, we need to, like, agree on what we're talking about. You know, what are we exactly looking for, you know? Uh, and uh, so... You know, because like you don't want to say like we're going to look for hu human beings, you know, like no matter what you see on Star Trek where everybody seems to look just like us on other planets, um, y you need a broader definition, so or at least a working definition. And so they they settled on something uh, was basically that, you know, that life is a is a uh, uh a chemically self-sustained system capable of Darwinian evolution. So that's what they that's what they settled on. Uh, and so you can find other ones that um, where people emphasize other things. Uh, you know that they really emphasize uh, metabolism or you know anything anything capable of evolving is is alive or what have you. Um, uh, but you know, I'd say that that the NASA uh, definition is is perhaps the the most common one you'll see, maybe because it's one of the shortest. All right, so that's life. What about death? Just that stopping in a system that used to have it. Well, you know, NASA did not uh, ask scientists to define death, <laughs> and uh, you know, really, like they were just more interested in like the presence of life versus the absence. So, like, you know the moon is not alive the moon is not life you know because the moon is a rock but is it uh, dead um well um it, i mean okay i do, you know, no scientist would like use the language of death to describe the moon you know they would might say it's abiotic you know in other words not having anything to do with life uh, it was never alive um but yeah, defining death becomes a big challenge. Um, and, uh, you know, just just in medicine, it's been uh, very challenging um, for for centuries, really. I mean, physicians had this problem where some of their patients, you know, they they didn't seem very alive, but were they dead yet? You know, like, it was it was it time to, you know, dig a grave for them? And, um you know, there was a great terror actually in the 1700s and the 1800s that people would be buried prematurely. And so you could actually um, request to be buried in a coffin that would have like a little hole in it with a with a, like a wire that could run out it was of it. It was a little bell, wasn't it? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. In Germany in the 1800s, in the late 1800s, actually, there would be these sort of um, uh, kind of like funeral parlors, but really what they were, they were just like people would be taken to these, these very large buildings and they'd just be put there just for a few days, just laid out. Just And, and again, they would have a little bell there just in case um, they came back. Um, they didn't, but um, but there was this anxiety because no one could really say like, boom, this person is dead, you know. The stethoscope obviously helped things a lot because, you know, if you waited for a while and, you know, there was no heartbeat, then, you know, maybe we could agree on that. Um, on the other hand, if someone had been, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, suffered from hyper uh, uh, hypothermia, you know, that might be kind of ambiguous. The big problem for us came about um, through the invention of ventilators. So you would have these situations in which um, someone you know, had massive brain damage and uh, would be unable to uh, to even breathe on their own because they, they lacked the connections to the brain required for breathing. So you would, uh, you know, put these people on ventilators um, and, you know, some of them might be able to recover somewhat. Um, most of them just, you know, lived for a couple of days at most and then died. Uh, and, you know, in the 1960s, this is actually at the time when organ transplantation was becoming a reality. And uh, these transplant surgeons were saying, like, uh, 
here are all these people who are really they're they're effectively dead. They're they're going to be dying very shortly, and we need organs, you know. And if we wait for people to die and then go about taking organs, those organs are degraded, you know. So they're worse for the for the people receiving them. So what if we were to say brain death is death? Or if, what if we just say like there's no hope that this person is coming back? That's it, you know. And so we get, you know, if they want to donate their organs. Now's the time we do it. Um, this is more, you know, this, this, this a lot of this is like a, a social agreement, you know. You can't say it's a pure science. It's us as people making a decision about these very difficult situations, not just the difficult situation of the person who's on the ventilator, but the difficult situation of the person who's going to die if they don't get an organ. Um, and, you know, there can, there have been, you know, sometimes there have been conflicts over that. Yeah, you, know, you can so see for, how perverse incentives could arise here. Sure, sure. And, but also you can see how, uh, if people don't agree with this particular definition of life and death, that they might say like, no, um, we don't want you to declare our daughter dead. And this actually is a case that happened. I write about in the book, um, where, um, a, a, a girl in California, um, you know, she, she went on a ventilator and suffered massive brain damage and went, went on a ventilator after a surgery that had gone bad and her family didn't want her declared dead. Um, and so she she was actually flown from California where a death certificate had been issued to New Jersey where there were these religious exceptions uh, made. And she actually was taken off the ventilator and um, she was she was able to live for several years, you know, in this state. Um, uh, you know, she went through puberty. Um, you know, the, she was, I should say she was still on the ventilator, but you know, her body was continuing to grow and to mature. So, uh, and then she died of internal bleeding and then got a second death certificate, you know, it's, so it's, it, it's an extreme exam, uh, demonstration of how hard it can be for us to agree on what it means to be alive and then what it means to be dead. What about cryptobiotic species? Yeah, cryptobiotic species are amazing, uh, and uh, they are they are these these uh, animals and and other species that just totally like make fun of us uh, in terms of our our notion that there's a clear dividing line between life and death. Um, so one example are these little animals called tardigrades. Um, they're barely visible to the naked eye. They're in the soil. They're uh, in the ocean. They're all over the place, and um, they're sometimes called water bears because uh, they they have this cute kind of bear-like appearance. Um, and what's amazing is that um, if if they're in a, a situation where they're they're in a drought, where their their environment is drying out, um, this is a situation where we would just die. I mean, if you if you lost a substantial amount of water from your body, your biochemistry falls apart. You're dead. Um, they don't die, however. They they can actually survive for decades, maybe over a century, completely desiccated. Um, they have been sent out into space and then brought back. And if you just put them back in water, they're back to the way they were before. And so scientists are trying to understand, well, what do the water bears do? What do these tardigrades do? And what they seem to do is they, they do these amazing um, chemical tricks to to uh, to go into this state that sometimes people call it a third state, cryptobiosis. Um, they, uh, and, and one of the key things that they do is they start making a special kind of protein that encases all of their essential molecules in their cells, kind of like glass. So that you can imagine that these animals are basically turning themselves into a kind of a protein glass. Nothing's moving. Um, and if nothing's moving on the molecular level, you can't say that you're alive by most definitions of life. I mean, there's no ac chemical activity. There's no metabolism. That's just not happening. But they're not dead. In other words, they're not falling apart. They're not disintegrating. Um, they're just on pause and can stay on pause for decades, maybe centuries. Um, and, uh, and it turns out there are more and more of these species uh, plants, fungi that may be able to do the same thing. Yeah. So that defeats my previous definition of death. 
being an absence of a thing that used to be alive. Right. I mean, I, I think, you know, you are thinking about, you're thinking about death, you know, uh, uh, human death, you know, the death we know best, you know, and, you know, for the most part, um, you know, if there's an absence of certain key things, you know, if you, if, if you can't breathe, if your heart stops, if your brain's not working, like, boom, everything's going to fall apart um, and you're and you're not coming back. Um, but that's just that's not a universal rule. It doesn't have to be that way um, that, you know, uh, life doesn't really care about our absolutes that way. What about some other animals, some other interesting creatures that you found in your research for the book that have weird, weird ideas about life and death? Uh, yeah, well, I, you know, there are certainly um, things that uh, features of living things that, that people talk about a lot, you know, hallmarks of life, sometimes they're called. And so one of the hallmarks is metabolism, um, the ability to, to take stuff in, to, to, to use it to generate energy and to, to produce biomass. And, uh, you know, metabolism is, is chemically speaking, it's really similar in some fundamental ways from species to species to species. I mean, the, anywhere you look, metabolism uh, is, involves this one molecule, our, our, our basic fuel, ATP. Um, so bacteria, they, they're making ATP, we're making ATP, snakes are making ATP. Uh, but there are just some... There are some species that are just really amazing, metabolically speaking, uh, and and really stand out. They're they're exemplars. And so one example is is certain kinds of snakes like boa constrictors or pythons. Uh, and so I I went to to visit a scientist who studies them and hung out with some of these massive snakes, these amazing animals. And you know they they can go for weeks without eating anything. Uh, and they're fine. And then, uh, then, you know, they can suddenly like leap into action, attack something, um, whether it's someone feeding them a rat or if they're, you know, a python out in the wild might kill a deer. Um, and then they will suddenly swallow something there that can be their own weight and then break that down. So over the next few days, they completely digested all this after a little pot of fur coming out the other end. Um, and so there are some scientists who have been studying this this amazing feat of metabolism. Um, it, it's it's not it's not easy to do this. It actually, you know, they're they're eating these things to get uh, energy out, but they have to put a lot of energy in. You know, they have to they have to make an investment to get all that return. Um, and so you know, part of what is involved is they have to basically like retool their whole body like in a matter of hours so like as soon as they're starting to swallow something all sorts of things start to happen in their bodies their intestinal walls double in length in thickness um their hearts uh increase i think is about 50 percent in size their livers get bigger i mean we're again we're talking about this happening in a matter of hours uh and so that way they're a, they're ready to handle this incredible challenge of, of breaking down this this whole animal ex, and extracting as many nutrients as possible, moving them around the body as fast as possible. And then once the uh, that prey is digested, you know the intestine goes back to its normal thickness, the heart shrinks back down, um, everything goes back to the way it was. And so um, so. So scientists would love to understand this better because this could have all sorts of important implications for human health. You know, um, uh, they, you know, the snakes are, 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 you know, are able to go through these remarkable changes in organ size or, or uh, chemistry in the blood and so on that might have implications for, for diabetes, for maybe even growing organs, just all sorts of uh, potential clues might be there in how these particular species uh, species just you know use this particular strategy to stay alive it's like being two animals in one it really is yeah because yeah you just you snap into this sort of eating mode um and then you go back to you know not eating for weeks and then hopefully uh, a few weeks later you go snap back into eating mode again and what's interesting is we think of snakes as being uh cold-blooded um 
but the fact is that um, they're they're effectively warm blooded when they are digesting something, because they're they're use they're, they're they're you know using so much fuel they're burning fuel they're giving off heat as a byproduct of the work they're putting into digesting things so that you know you can you can sort of if you use one of these sort of, you know heat imaging uh, cameras you can see them glowing uh, because of that they're 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 effectively warm blooded just for that period of time um, the me- their metabolic rate is um, roughly on par with that of a galloping horse. Um, now, you know, a racehorse might run for a couple minutes and then we give them a big prize and say, congratulations. But these snakes, they're keeping up that metabolic rate for several days when they're just lying there. It's, it's astonishing. What about fungi and mushrooms and stuff? They must be an interesting case study for life. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we, uh, you know, animals are fascinating and bizarre. So I just talked about snakes. I talked about tardigrades, but you know, they're very close to us on the tree of life. And, um, you know, if you look further afield, you get to see like weirder things, um, things that don't even have bodies as we think of them. Um, so in the book, I write about slime molds, um, which are, they're not, they're not fungi, although they look kind of like fungi. They're sort of these giant single cell blobby organisms that you can see um, in the summer when you're walking around in the forest. Um, They have very evocative names. There's one species that's called dog's vomit because that's exactly what it looks like. You're walking along, you're like, wow, who puked here? It's it's an organism. It's alive. And, And that pool of vomit is actually one giant cell that is spreading out its tentacles across the forest floor and feeding on bacteria that it finds. So scientists love to study slime molds because you can take a little bit of it and dry it out, take it to your lab, and then splash some water on it, and it starts to grow. And those tentacles start to go grow across a petri dish. Um, and scientists have found that um, you just need to give them a little oatmeal, and they're very happy um, because oatmeal flakes have uh, bacteria growing on them. So they'll smell, essentially smell or taste the uh the oatmeal and they'll just send their tentacles out across a petri dish until they find it um now what happens when you've got like three or four different clumps of oatmeal on a petri dish well you know the the slime mold wants it all but you know it doesn't want to like build like a whole sheet of tentacles that's a big waste of effort so what it'll end up doing is it'll, cre- it'll create this beautiful network of tentacles that's the shortest distance between those uh, little clumps of oatmeal. It's solving a mathematical problem um, in order to eat. Um, so scientists have all sorts of fun uh, keep running experiments with them. They put them in mazes. The, the slime molds send their tentacles through the mazes and solve them. Um, they they do all sorts of, uh, of, of these things. And... Um, and again, this is something fundamental about life. Um, you know, that in other words, that a slime mold is like us and that it takes in information about surroundings and then it does something. It does something to sort of improve its chances of survival. You know, it respond, it behaves in a way that's better than random. Um, and so, you know, the scientists who study slime molds, they like to call this capacity intelligence so you could say that that intelligence is one of the hallmarks of life because everything from us to a slime mold has it Um, and it's just easier to study in a slime mold in a petri dish because you can just run experiment over experiment over experiment Um, and they you know clearly you don't need a brain to be intelligent because these slime molds are literally solving math problems with no need of a brain yeah, it seems like they've got intelligence, and if they do a maze, they must have memory, and if they're able to detect things around them, they must have some sort of senses of some kind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they seem to have have all of that. Uh, <laughs> and it's not clear, it's not really clear how they've got it. <laughs> I mean, so for example, um, it could be that that it's you just need some very simple strategies to to tap into these kinds of intelligence. So, um, for example, um, slime molds, you know, they can detect where they've been. 
Um, in other words, like if they've extended out a tentacle and they retract it back and then they're extending another tentacle and that crosses to where they were, they can kind of they can kind of taste their own trail and they don't like it. So they'll they'll sort of move away from that place where they've been. So that is a way for them to not basically just keep going back to the same place over and over again. You know, if there's like a bad, you know, if there's some sort of toxin or, or sort of bright sunlight, which they hate in a certain area um, and they retract their tentacle, they're not going to make that same mistake again because they're like, oh, OK, that direction is bad. I've been there. Didn't work out. I'm going to go over here. So that helps them to get around barriers to, uh, you know, go go through mazes and so on. That's kind of like a rudimentary memory, but it's not sort of symbolic. It's not phenomenological. It's just leaving little trails here and there, and then you detect the trails again. What about? Yeah, you're you're sort of you're making yeah you're you, it's like an external memory. Yeah. So you don't need a hippocampus tucked away in your brain. You're just like okay, I'm gonna like leave a little trail there, and I know that when I if I reach that again, that reminds me oh, I don't want to be here. Don't come back here. Yeah, exactly. What about phanatology? Yeah, so thanatology is is this wonderful name for basically the science of death, um, and uh, it's it, there. There is a small but dedicated group of scientists who who study uh, you know the science of death. Particularly, uh, there are, are scientists who are interested in how how animals um, respond to death, recognize uh, that you know other animals are dead. Um, there's a particular sort of specialty of thanatology called primate thanatology, which is um, which is particularly important um, for us in terms of understanding where our own concepts of life and death came from. Um, so, for example, you know the uh, Jane Goodall, um, the the famous primatologist, you know she spent years just sitting with chimpanzees observing them day in day out and um she would just see things that you wouldn't see if if you just came to visit them quickly in one case she, there was a uh, a, a female uh, chimpanzee with with a baby and um the baby wasn't looking well and then the next day it was obvious to good all that the baby was dead and she could see that the the mother was treating it differently now uh, was sort of just carrying it around but sort of in a sort of strange way just sort of uh, holding it by a foot and things like that and then after a few days eventually let it go just it, it left it behind and you know there that's just like one observation but since then in the decades since the 1960s there have been more and more observations of of primates and and how they respond to the death of their their uh, fellow members of their species, and th and that you know is is sort of ha leading to theories about well um, how what are evolutionary roots of our concept of death? Um, you know we it's probably you know probably you know a chimpanzee recognize. A chimpanzee doesn't say to itself, oh, this other chimpanzee is dead, but there is a confusion because, you know, they're, they're looking at something that, that the biological part of their brain, uh, there's biological sensing part of the brain would say, well, this is something that's alive. It's got a face, it's, you know, and, and so on, but, um, but it's not moving or it's arms are at a strange angle that living chimpanzees don't have. And it may be that it takes a while to 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 overcome that, to override that. Um, so we can, you know, it's not. It takes quite a while in the fossil record for humans to really show our, you know, how how sort of modern examples of recognizing death, you know, a, a funeral, for example. And that's probably just in the past, maybe hundred thousand years, that there are these rituals that humans performed. Uh, in, in conjunction with death. So in the million years, millions of years before that, they were probably behaving a lot more like the chimpanzees. Have you thought about what other types of life forms there might be out there in the universe? I watched a series on Netflix not long ago where they were talking about silicon-based life and all sorts of other exotic things. Do you look into this? Yeah, there's actually... Um, a small but really fascinating little thread of scientific research that goes back a um, hundred years uh, of people trying to think of alternate life 
sometimes they like to call it weird life um, because they, they call it weird because, you know, life as we know it uh, on Earth is is kind of boring, just in the sense that uh, familiar. Uh, f well, uh, boring in the sense that it's like, oh, here's another species. Like if you find a species, a new species of bird, I can guarantee that it uses ATP. I can guarantee that it has its genes encoded in DNA. Uh, there are all these things I can guarantee it. Um, I can either I can even get down to like what is the genetic code that it uses to translate its genes into proteins. Like just down to that level, there's not a lot of variety. So so all the wonderful variation that we see and all these weird things I've been talking about, that's in a way kind of external. Like at the at the core, life on Earth is very similar. Now that could be because that could be because there's just one way to do it. There's just one way to do life, and and that's what we see around us. And there's no other way to do it. Um, the, you know, the rules of of matter and energy don't allow anything else. Or that's just what happened to start here on Earth. Or maybe there were two different kinds of life on Earth, <clears throat> and our form won out, and the other one's extinct. Um, we have no idea. And and so, you know, until we start to go to planets and moons and, and, and see whether they have life at all, and if they do, what form it takes, will we be able to say, you know, is, is silicon life possible? You know, chemically speaking, it, 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 maybe it could be, um, you know, because some people have said, <coughs> well... You know, what, what is it about DNA that, that's so important? Well, it's important because it's a way to store information that you can then use to build other molecules. Um, well, there, are, there could be ways of using silicon or some other uh, materials essentially to work as genes. Um, and in, while we wait f to finally get to other planets and moons to really, really look hard for life, um, some scientists are saying, well, who cares? Let's start. Let's get to work. And they're trying to build these systems in their labs. Um, and so you actually are seeing kind of alternatives to DNA that, that scientists are building and trying to figure out if they can make them work. Was there anything else other than silicon? Silicon is is one of the main ones. Um, there's also an issue about um, the the matter of water. So that's another boring thing about life is that uh, on Earth is that it needs water. Is you know, that because of the ATP? Well, that's because uh, the the chemical reactions that that make ATP possible and uh, and lots of other chemical reactions um, they need water to act as a solvent. Um, and so, you know, water interacts with proteins um, to, uh, in all sorts of important ways, with our DNA as well. Um, and so, so we need, you know, we need water as a solvent um, in, in our bodies. Um, you know, there are other solvents, you know, um, yeah, kerosene. You know, like <laughs> we would not want to drink kerosene, um, but maybe kerosene or, 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 you know, liquid ethane or something like that. Um, maybe that could be a solvent for some alternate form of life. And, you know, this is this actually is not like a totally um, pure thought experiment because, you know, there are some parts of the solar system, some moons where um there isn't liquid water, but there might be liquid ethane. Um, and so, you know, it's it's actually really interesting to say, like, well, could there be life there? You know, uh, are, are, is it impossible for there to be life there? Or would, might there be some bizarre, super cold ethane-based life uh, out in our own solar system? Who knows? One of the coolest things that I looked at, I'll try and find, I can't remember the name of the documentary. It was something like, different alien worlds a museum it was just on youtube it was so good mm. and it sort of moved through all of these different pretend exhibits within a museum and it explained how they all might come about one of the things that that video said was the likelihood of finding really really intelligent advanced civilizations that are water-based is essentially zero and the reason is that in order to become technologically advanced you need smithing 
You need to be able to heat stuff up. You need to be able to create things in ways that allows you to get outside of your... And when you're underwater, that's really, really hard. So that was something that I hadn't considered as well, that you kind of have a a cap on technological development for a civilization if it's water-based. And um, Children of Ruin by Adrian Tchaikovsky, he's got these um, these huge orbs that have got uh, super intelligent octopuses in, octopi. And um, <laughs> they're flying these massive orbs of water around. And um, yeah, it's, so, it's such a funny idea. Well, what about, given that we've talked about alien life origins, what about origins of life on Earth? So there again, you know, the definition of life is really important because uh, <clears throat> if you want to talk about when life began on Earth, you have to say like, well, uh, th- this is the kind of thing that we would say was the original That's form of life. That's the threshold we have crossed that now is defined as, yes. Yeah, and and so you know, clearly, like you know, a, a, a pool that's just full of you know loose bits of peptides and nucleotides is an, an ATP. That's that's not alive. That's you know, that's a primordial soup. That is just a, a mixture of, of molecules that you know, if they were to come together in a certain way and could sustain themselves and reproduce, we might call them alive. Um, So then the big question is, how do you get from one to the other? Uh, And so in the book, I talk about um, how, you know, scientists are are, uh, trying to uh, do experiments and going to extreme environments on Earth to to address this question. Um, What's fascinating to me is that there are two really um, well thought out, fleshed out scenarios for how life might have started on Earth, uh, and they're completely mutually exclusive. So on the one hand, you have uh, some people who are saying that life started on the surface. So like four billion years ago, there may have just been a few volcanic islands popping up through uh, above the ocean surface, and you might have little ponds there. And in those ponds, as they as they filled up with water and dried out, you would have a series of chemical reactions that might have actually produced RNA and then might have been able to encapsulate the RNA into protocells. So there you got some people who say that's where life started. You have other people who say, nope, life started at the bottom of the ocean um, at these uh, vents in the, in the seafloor where you have these magnificent sort of mineral towers that form as, as hot mineral laced water shoots up from the earth's interior. And as that water and those chemicals get pushed through uh, the these chimneys, all sorts of interesting chemistry happens, and then you could actually start to it could start to build up on itself, and you start to produce the molecules that will eventually become our genes. You start to produce membranes that might eventually become our cell walls, and so on. Um, So, you know, they might both be right. (laughs) Maybe one of them is right for Earth and one of them is right for a a moon in orbit around Saturn. Um, It's hard. It's hard to say. Um, But, you know, along the way, you know, the these uh, lines of research, they they lead to amazing discoveries, um, very practical ones uh, in some cases. So, for example, right now in the pandemic, a really important way that scientists figure out, uh, you know, whether, you know, SARS-CoV-2 is infecting someone or what kind of SARS-CoV-2, what variant it is, they use a special kind of DNA sequencing called nanopore sequencing. Um, It's a pretty new uh, technology. It's like the sequencer is like is smaller than your iPhone. You plug it into your computer. Um, That was actually developed by people who were trying to understand the origin of life because uh, the, the, the fundamental way that it works is that DNA gets run through a little pore. Um, and that was something that people were thinking about when they were thinking, well, okay, when you have these protocells, they, they're going to need to get stuff in and out. We have very elaborate channels and, and various portals in our cells, but well, how would this all begin? Um, it couldn't be a perfectly sealed bubble. Stuff is going to get in and out. And someone was like, well, maybe they just have a simple pore. Maybe you could get a genetic molecule in and out. And then he said, this is someone named David Deemer, uh, University of California at Santa Cruz. He said, wait a minute. 
like if I'm pulling DNA in and out through a pore, it's going to generate an electric uh, current, a tiny, a tiny current. And we might be able to measure that. Um, and 30 years later, that's how we are uh, one of the tools we're using in the pandemic. That's sick. What about viruses then? Are viruses alive? <laughs> uh, again, it really depends on who you ask. I mean, I one morning um, I had a virologist email me and tell me, of course, viruses are not alive, and any expert would tell you that. And then that afternoon, another one said, well, of course, viruses are alive, and any expert will tell you that. Um, so, you know, as a science writer, as a sort of a chronicler of science, it's kind of a, a, an awkward position to be in because, you know, people ask me questions as if there's some sort of, you know, clear cut answers that I'm I can refer to. Whose science do you uh, go with? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, science is, you know, d debate and conflict is at the heart of science. There's nothing wrong with, with debates, you know, just as long as that they're, you know, meaningful ones. And this is a very meaningful one because um, it really forces us to think about, well, what are viruses in themselves? How do they work? And, you know, what do what does it take for something to be alive? And, and you know, what do we even mean when we're using these, these terms? The thing about viruses is that <clears throat> if you line them up next to a cell, they're very different. They're not just much smaller than a cell, but you know, a cell is full of ATP, like I mentioned, or fuel. There's just constant metabolism going on. Molecules are being built. Other ones are being torn apart. They're pulling in things from their environment. It's this, just this, this, uh, you know, buzzing hive of activity. You look at a virus, um, just what scientists would call a virion, just a little thing floating around on its own. It's just a little protein shell with some genes inside, just wrapped up nice and tight. That's it. It's, it's not doing anything to keep itself going. What has to happen for a virus to replicate is that it has to fuse with a cell, and it goes in, and now the cell basically just starts treating the virus's genes like its own genes. The, uh, it starts making those viral proteins. Those viral proteins then take over the cell and make the cell make new viruses, which then leave the cell to go infect other ones. So, you know, one of the architects of that NASA working definition of life was asked, well, if life is this chemically self-sustaining system capable of Darwinian evolution, um, are viruses alive? And he said, you know, according to this definition, no, they don't make the cut. You know, they don't, they can't sustain themselves. Um, other people say, well, you can't understand viruses without looking at them as being part of life. You know, viruses evolve. I mean, just look at the variants that are making our lives miserable. You know, the Delta variant didn't exist before October of last year. It evolved from earlier forms of the virus. Um, and uh, so, and it it follows all the same rules of evolution that animals or plants do. It's It's a classic evolving thing so um so the, so pe so people make a number of arguments about um how, how viruses really are alive based on a number of different ways of, of looking at it um and um you know it it could be that there may actually be viruses that really blur the line and and could make this even more interesting because there are certain viruses that <clears throat> you know, they have genes for things that are not just for making new viruses. You know, they have genes for building proteins. They have genes for photosynthesis. And they just carry those genes along. And then once they get inside the cell, they basically like tell the cell like, okay, here's what you're going to be doing now. You know, you're going to be photosynthesizing in a different way. You're going to be capturing sunlight in, in turning that into molecules that are better for making viruses than for making more cells. So let's get to work. Um, and, you know, it's so there are ways in which, you know, viruses themselves may may make this question even harder to answer. I had a geneticist on a while ago talking about how we could engineer life to reach other space systems. And he was saying that one of the things Dr. David Sinclair's talking about some of this stuff in his longevity research lab in Harvard, where you have particular types of viruses that are turned on and turned off with antibiotics or with uh particular types of bacteria i think and then you could have he had created this idea of a human who had 
um, photosynthetic skin. And you'd need, I think he worked out, in order to survive, you'd need about two tennis courts worth of skin just laid out. <laughs> um, but he kind of imagined these green humans that wouldn't need food. You wouldn't need to carry all the food with you because you can just have your, your tennis court of wings stuck out to the sides and then you can just get all of your sunlight and you could exist like that. So, yeah, it's um, it's funny how all of this stuff comes together. So if it, it seems like there's quite a bit of chaos trying to work out what's going on here. Did you arrive or discover a, a better definition of life? Uh I think the most radical uh, proposal um, that I came across was uh, from a philosopher named Carol Cleland at the University of Colorado who said, don't try to define life. Definitions are pointless. You're wasting your time. And, you know, this really like bothers uh, a, a lot of scientists because they think that um, that definitions are just part of what they do. Um, but in fact, um, you know, if you're not careful, you can get into sort of language traps. Um, so for example, um, uh, you think about, uh, uh, water, you know, think about an alchemist trying to define water for you in 1500, uh, and the alchemists did, and they would, and what they would do is they would like list off some characteristics it had like, well, water is something that's transparent, something that's wet, something that dissolves certain things. Like that's my definition of water. Um, but then there were certain things that looked a lot like water, but were dissolving other things. Like it dissolved certain kinds of metal. So were they water? Well, they would actually say like, oh, we're going to call this royal water. And then you'd have a problem when it got cold and this liquid water froze and became something called ice. Is ice water? Well, strictly speaking, by the definition, no. Um, and so, you know, even Leonardo da Vinci writes his, in his journal about how frustrating it is that water just seems to be whatever you want it to be. It's just maddening. Um, so the definitions did not help in understanding what, what was necessary was a few more centuries of, of research and the invention of chemistry as a science. Um, you, you, the way to talk about water is to talk about it in terms of with, with in a theory a theory of atoms and elements of molecules you know and then you can talk about uh, molecules of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom and now you're really having a meaningful understanding of it so so what carol cleland argues is that what we really need is a theory of life which we do not have yet um, there are people working on it um, but um, until we have that if we just try, if we waste time coming up with hundreds more definitions of life and yelling at each other about it, that's time we could have spent moving towards a real theory of life. Yeah, it's interesting thinking about that. I think I think it was you that said it's like trying to describe red or effort. It's always described in terms of analogies, and then we have this sort of imperfect language, so you just end up playing lexical Brazilian jiu-jitsu in an effort to try and work out the closest approximation of the thing that you mean. And then as soon as you make an analogy, the analogy is always slightly imperfect because by definition, it isn't the thing you're talking about. It's a thing like the thing that you're talking about. And um, yeah, I'm glad, I'd, I'm glad I don't work in the theory of life business, uh, <laughs> frankly. Well, it's, it's, it's not for the faint of heart, that's for sure. And, you know, in, in the book, I actually write about, you know, some figures in history who, who really tried to go out there to life's edge, the title of the book, and you know that edge where you're trying to figure out what divides life from non-life, and they've they've flamed out, they've made terrible mistakes, and they've they've uh, gone down, you know, gone down into obscurity for for coming up with crazy ideas that really just were were completely off base. Um, you know, we we. We, t we, we tend to think of science as just nothing but a sort of a series of triumphs and, and a, a, a linear progression from one deep insight to the next. And, you know, that's not how science works. Science is, is full of, of branches in different directions, many of which just lead to complete failure. Who, who um, is one of those failures? Well, I talk in the beginning of the book about a physicist named John Butler Burke, who um, he was at Cambridge and he was working at this lab where in, in the early 1900s where you know the electron had just been discovered you know qu quantum physics was was being 
uh, uncovered for the first time in places like this lab. Um, <clears throat> radioactivity was was uh, another thing that was fascinating people there because it could tell you about how atoms worked in this very strange way. And people were fascinated by the element radium, for example, and they they would you know there would be dance performances where the dancers were were dressed in radium clothing that glowed in the dark. Um, and so in this context, Burke uh, thought, well, maybe you know ra radioactivity is is at the at the maybe that's what life's about. You know, maybe radioactivity is the organizing principle behind life. And so he ran an experiment where he took some sterilized beef broth and he dropped some radium into it and then let it stay there overnight. And then he went into the lab the next day and he saw that a, a layer had formed on top of the broth. And so he scooped some of that out, put it in a, a slide, looked at it under a microscope, and he convinced himself that he was seeing um, microbes, um, t teeny tiny structures that grew and became more complex over time that seemed to divide. <clears throat> and these were much smaller than microbes, and but they seemed to be alive to him, or at least to be right on the border. And so he named them radiobes after radioactivity, published a paper about them, wrote a book about them, was just the, the talk of the town. I mean, people were saying that Burke was important as Darwin. Uh, and this glory lasted for maybe a year <laughs> until some other scientists reran the experiments and showed that it was all um, a fluke from bad chemistry. You know, if you use distilled water, this just didn't happen. Uh, and that was it. And he, for the rest of his life, uh, insisted that um, that he uh, uh, had been right and that radiobes really were there at the at the at that life's edge. Um, and, uh, you know, nobody knows who Burke is now. Um, you know, in a way he was a real pioneer, you know, he actually used the term artificial life for the first time for what he had done, you know, trying to make life in a lab. He was trying to do it. Um, but, uh, but we don't remember him because he was playing this very, very dangerous game. Dangerous status job being a scientist. Life's Edge, the search for what it means to be alive, will be linked in the show notes below. If people want to keep up to date with what you do, where should they go? Uh, my website is carlzimmer.com, and uh, I'm Carl Zimmer on Twitter. I love it. Thanks, Carl. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.